So in this video, we're going to get introduced to limits, which depending on the calculus course you're taking, you may have dealt with all of this stuff in pre-calculus, or you may have dealt with none of this stuff, but we wouldn't have calculus without limits. And how we're going to see it is we're going to start with a working definition, something that'll be good enough for most of our problems, but is not rigorous when we really start looking into it deeply. And so, um, first off the notation, we can have LIM for limit as x approaches some value of some function is equal to whatever the limit is. Today. x is approaching a value of a function and the limit is equal to something. And what this means is as x gets closer to a, f of x gets closer to l. And the idea is sort of getting closer and closer, getting closer and closer, squeezing in, and we should be able to get sort of infinitesimally close to a and close to l. We don't actually look at A, and it doesn't actually need to get to L. It can. A lot of problems we're going to see um, will do that. But this is the idea. So there are a couple of ways to do this. I'm going to go into the methods to figure this out, and then we'll see an example. So one method is looking at it graphically. And if you look at it graphically, you can first graph the function. And then second, you can look at the curve as x approaches a. And the important thing here as we start seeing some examples is this. We have to consider as it approaches a from both sides, meaning from the left and from the right. A different method is to make a table. And so in this case, instead of graphing the function, we can make, I'm going to call it an xy table, but an input-output table for the function. And in that table, we need to choose x values that approach A from both sides. Some of them being larger than A, some of them being smaller than A. And the, the important part is showing that it sort of squeezes in what happens as we get closer and closer to A. So before I point out some of the possible pitfalls that people fall into with this, let's look at um, an example. Okay, Evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. And one option is to do this graphically. So we could go ahead and use our graphing calculator and graph x squared. And we see this graph. And I could trace as x gets close to 2. And so x is 0 here. I'll go further left. And as I get closer and closer to 2, Let's see. So at negative 1.7, I was at 2.89-ish. Negative 1.9, I was at 3.6668. And then on the other side, at negative 2.34, I'm at 5.47. Negative 2.12, I'm at 4.5. It may be hard to see what this is approaching. We have a pretty good idea what it's approaching. Um, but I can zoom in. And that's about where I want to zoom in. I want to see what's happening around x equals, oh sorry, positive 2. So I should be over here. And over here, again, I'm not exactly at 2, but I can trace. And now, I can when I move left and right, 
I change the x by far less, and I can get even closer. So you see, okay, as I'm going to the right to get closer to x equals 2, this 3.46 is getting larger to 3.66, 3.87, and now my x is beyond. And as I come from the right, I see that it's getting smaller and smaller, and I can zoom in some more. And I can continue this until I see, okay, as I get this as close as I can to 2, this is getting very close to 4, which shouldn't be a surprise. So let me go into this, and the one option, first option that we have here, is to make a little graph. Graph my function. We know what x squared looks like. And I like sort of drawing this. As we get close to 2 from the left and from the right, the output gets close to 4. So the limit is equal to 4. That should not be surprising because 2 squared is 4. However, we can't always use that um, evaluating a limit by evaluating the function. And we'll see when we can and can't a few videos down the road when we talk about continuity. So that's one option. Another option is to make the table, and I'll show that option as well. So I will make an x, and I'll, just, I'll make this x squared, that's our function. And I want to show this squeezing into 2. So, well, 1 is less than 2, but that's still pretty far from 2. So 1.9 is less than 2, and 1.99, I can continue this adding more and more 9s in this case until I get closer and closer to 2. But I'm never going to actually put in a 2 for a limit. I just care what happens when I get close to it. On the other side of things, um, 3 is larger than 2, but it's pretty far away. So I can try 2.1, that's closer, or 2.01, and if that's not good enough, I can get smaller and smaller. Easiest way for me to evaluate this, like with that, is to go to the calculator. I could do this by hand, but why would I? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to set up the um, table, so table set, and I'm going to tell it that I want to, um, I want to ask me for the independent variables, the x values, so I can tell it which ones to put in. And now when I go to the table, it's empty, but I can put in 1, and f of 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, no big surprise. I can put in 1.9, and you see I have everything sitting right in front of me without having to go back. I can put in 1.99, and if that wasn't good enough, I can put in 1.999. I'll, I'll do that. I didn't really need it. It's not on my table. But you can see, okay, I see what this is approaching. And then from the other side, so 2 point, I'll put in 0, 0, 1. It's not in my table here, but I'll put it in there. And 2.01. And 2.1. And so we see this. I can put in 3 as well. 3 squared is 9. So let me transfer these numbers over here. We'll talk about them briefly, and then we'll be good. So 1, 3.61, and 3.9601. So 1, 3.61, and 3.9601. And on the other side, we had 4.0401. Four point four one and nine. And as you can see, these numbers, the y values or the x squared values, are both getting closer and closer to four. So limits equal to four. Either way it works. This can sometimes be nice if I have a really tough decimal number, whereas this graph, I know what x squared behaves like so much that I can just sort of look at the graph and see it. But some possible pitfalls. Um, you notice I never in my table put in two. It's a, tr it's a shortcut that I can use sometimes, but I don't actually care what happens at x equals a. So we saw a couple of different, or we saw one possibility, but there's some other possibilities for this graph. So 
the possibility that we saw already was this sort of case where my function had no breaks, no issues here, and at f of a, the limit was l. Let's get closer and closer. I get closer and closer to l. But what happens if I do have a break in the graph there? So x is at a, and this whole would have a value of l. Well, this limit is still l. I don't care what happens at x equals a, I just care what happens as I'm approaching x equals a. And if I made my table, I never put in this value, just put values that are close to it. And similarly, what if I have this hole here, this um, thing that's not in here, discontinuity, but I do have a value. So this one, f of a is undefined. This one, f of a is defined, it's just above where our old limit was. And to answer this question, well, the limit is still the same thing. As I go at this from the left and from the right, I'm still approaching this L value. I'm not approaching this value up here. So for all of these, the limit as x approaches a of my function is equal to L. And this idea here where I don't even need to have a value at a is where limits will be useful in uh, calculus. Spoiler alert, eventually we're going to try to take a limit of a quotient where the numerator and denominator are both approaching zero, and you can't do zero divided by zero, but we can find the limit. So let's see an example like that. The limit as t approaches zero of sine of t over t. Now I use t instead of x, it doesn't matter. Um, same type of variable. I could graph this. I'll just jump to the graphing calculator to show you generally what it looks like. So um, I can't graph this with t, so I'll just use x's, but sine of x divided by x. And I'll change the zoom back to um, standard zoom. And here we see, okay. Now, as I zoom in, I'm going to do the same type of Thing we saw before graphically you see okay it looks pretty obvious as what the limit should be and it doesn't look like there's a problem except when you start thinking about hold on what happens at x equals zero and if I try to trace it doesn't give me a y value if I tried to make a table and I let me clear out this and put in zero when I try to put in zero for my table I get error. And that should be pretty obvious because sine of 0, 0 divided by 0 is undefined. So the calculator doesn't show it great, but we do know, because we know how things work, we're smarter than a calculator, that this function actually has this hole here. But we don't care what happens at zero. We just care what happens as we get close to zero. And from the left and from the right, it was clear from the graph that they're both approaching one. So the limit here is one, even though um, sine of zero equals zero and zero divided by zero is undefined. That doesn't matter. The limit is still equal to one. All right, a couple of rules. So um, these can be useful as we get further into the course and we need to do more things with limits. So if we are given that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l, and the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals m, then the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus g of x is going to equal l plus m. No weird changing from addition to multiplication like we might have to do when we're dealing with exponents or logarithms. Um, it just works straight through. And that should make sense because f is going to be approaching l, g is going to be approaching m, so that should approach l plus m. And difference works the same way. The limit as x approaches a of 
f of x minus g of x is equal to l minus m, the limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x will be l times m. And finally, the limit as x approaches a of f of x divided by g of x is going to be l over m, with one um, notable exception. Uh, this limit here cannot equal 0. If it equaled 0, then this would be undefined. So um, we have to have that case. There may be a case where this limit does equal 0, and we can still, we still can evaluate this. However, um, we couldn't use this rule to figure it out, because if I tried to do something divided by 0, this would be undefined. So that rule only applies when m is not equal to 0. Let's see an example where this makes a difference. So we're given that the limit as r approaches negative 3 of f of r is negative 7, and the limit as r approaches negative 3 of g of r equals 3, so we have this mess. Now the first thing to note here is this negative 3 doesn't do much for f or g other than tell me that I can use these rules. I'm not going to actually evaluate f of negative 3 or g of negative 3. And I'm going to break this down step by step, but it, it's actually pretty easy. You can skip almost all of the steps. So in here, the first thing I'm going to do is going to break up the limit of a difference. So this is the limit as r approaches negative 3 of 3 f of r minus the limit as r approaches negative 3 of r squared g of r f of r. So I use that limit of a difference rule. And now I'm going to use limit of a product to break all of these up. And so this is really the limit as r approaches negative 3 of 3 times the limit as r approaches negative 3 of f of r minus the limit as r approaches negative 3 of r squared times the limit as r approaches negative 3 of g of r times the limit as r approaches negative 3 of f of r. And in here, I can do this work. So the limit as r approaches negative 3 of 3, it's just going to be 3. It's a constant value. So as r gets closer and closer to negative 3, 3 gets closer and closer to 3. It doesn't change. This, I was given what the limit of f of r was. The limit of f of r is negative 7, so times negative 7 minus. I need to think here a little bit carefully. So as r approaches negative 3, r squared, and I'm thinking, OK, I have this quadratic. What happens when I get close to negative 3? And this gets closer and closer to 9. I was given what g of r approaches. g of r approaches 3. And f of r approaches negative 7 again. 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. Negative 9 times 3 times negative 7. Well, it's going to be plus because of the two negatives. Um, and I'm going to do 3 times 7, which is 21 times 9 is 189, and that should end up equaling 168. Make sure I do that right. Yes. All right. If there are any questions on this basic limit work, feel free to put them in the comments down below. Uh, in the next video, we'll talk about the rigorous definition because it gets closer and closer to is very loose, um, and we'll move on from there.